And we're really pleased today to have Ron Margulis speaking. He's a leading member of our sister organization in Turkey, and he's going to be speaking on compassion, empathy, and altruism, how evolution made us care. He'll speak for about 35 minutes, then we'll open up the meeting for questions and contribution. Shall I go there? Which no, he's, he's okay. Comrades, it's nice to see a full room, which I didn't expect. <laughs> Nevertheless, could I please ask any geneticists, uh, neurologists, biologists to leave? Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm none of those things. And you're just going to make life difficult for me. Um, if Richard Dawkins is here, could I ask you to leave as well? Because if he were here, he would think that I was arguing along the lines that he does, and I'm not. OK. What I'm going to try and do, as the title implies, is <clears throat> to argue that all these good things, like compassion, empathy, altruism, cooperation, helping each other, are not, are not in the way that a room full of Marxists would probably think socially taught, but are actually hardwired, in some way genetic, inherited, and formed by nat uh, natural selection. But before I do that, let me um, go through a couple of brief points to at least attempt to lighten the attacks which, will, which are likely to take place when I finish talking. <laughs> Um, first of all, let's not assume that everyone here is a biologist. So very simply, very crudely, let me tell you what, uh, how evolution works and what natural selection does. Um, basically, all living things um, pass the genes onto their children. And this pro in this process of your genes half your genes and half your wife's or husband's genes are copied to be passed on to the kid, there are photocopying errors, mutations. Most of these errors um, make no difference, and therefore they just stay there, um, causing nothing one way or another. A small number can have a positive or a negative effect on the kid who's got those Wrong, wrongly copied genes. Um, negative effect means that the, the gene stops the kid from surviving or, more importantly, from reproducing. The crucial thing is reproduction because it's a question of the genes being passed on and on and on. If it has a negative effect and stops the kid from living, from surviving much, then the gene disappears because the kid dies before it can pass the gene on. If it's a positive effect, what positive means is it allows the kid to reproduce more than other kids who haven't got the faulty, the wrongly copied gene. Uh, let me give you, give you an example. So, for example, if some beetle um, has a problem in the copying of one of the genes and this new uh, mutated gene causes the insect to look like a piece of stick, like a stick insect, it means the predators can't see it and therefore it will survive better. More importantly, it will reproduce more and more. It will reproduce more than other kids and therefore, that gene, which is advantageous, will be selected. It will be selected in the sense that that stick insect will have more kids, their kids will have more kids, and over time, that gene will be uh, in everyone in that population. 
I said selected. Don't be misled. No one selects anything at all. It's just a mechanical, natural process. But for ease, ease of, uh, you know, how to express this when we're talking, we say it's selected. So, if it gives the kid an advantage in reproduction, it's selected by natural selection. The second thing I want to uh, stress is that, except for a very few uh, of our characteristics, like eye color, hair color, whether we're tall or short, very simple physical characteristics, genes don't work in a one-to-one -one way. There is no gene which makes you a thief. There is no gene which makes you a good person. There is no homosexual gene. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way because, first of all, it isn't the case that one gene causes one characteristic. It's much more complex. Many genes go into uh, making up each of our char characteristics. But even more than that, there are switches. What used to be thought as junk DNA, because most of DNA seems to, to be doing nothing, and was called junk DNA. In fact, many of those are switches. They switch genes on and off. Um, so let me now give you examples. But you know whether it's switched on or off makes a difference as well. So it's not a one-to-one -one straightforward um, way in which genes work. Much more complex than that. Therefore. Nothing I shall say today should imply any kind of genetic determinism. I'm not saying that there are genes which make us compassionate or that there is a gene which makes my chair a nice person. It just doesn't work that way. If I say anything which opens the door to you interpreting what I said as genetic determinism, it means either that I've expressed myself clumsily, I'm not wrong, just clumsily expressed, <laughs> or you've misunderstood. OK. Now, there must be some um, reasons which make us suspect, make, at least make me suspect, that such things as empathy, altruism, compassion are genetically determined, I don't mean that, are uh, naturally selected. And let me give you three reasons why there is at least reason for us to suspect that they are hardwired and were naturally selected rather than socially imposed or taught. Um, the first is this. These characteristics compassion, etc., are to be found in every single human society. Not only that, but they are valued and considered to be good things in every single human society, from hunter-gatherer groups who live in the middle of the Amazon forest to the most advanced um, capitalist society. And note that, you know, in America, uh, multimillionaire crooks clearly are not compassionate and altruistic. Nevertheless, if you ask them, they are very unlikely to say altruism is shit, compassion is a terrible thing. They will say these are good things. Now, any human characteristic which is shared both historically and at the moment by all societies, clearly give us a hint that it's not socially formed. It's something to do with being human, possibly. That's one. Secondly, we know that these characteristics, to some degree, exist not only in human beings, homo sapiens, but in other uh, of our hominid relatives, 
all homo share this, these characteristics. That also gives us a hint, at least, that this is not something taught by particular human societies. It's widespread. So, for example, um, there are Neanderthal fossils, skeletons, almost everywhere, mostly in Europe, but elsewhere too. And many, many of those, because of the particular lifestyle uh, Neanderthals had, uh, close quarters, hunting, using spears rather than any weapon which can be used from a distance, hunting mammoths with spears, because of their lifestyle, um, they often suffered serious injury. And many of these skeletons show the signs of serious injury. Um, and yet, archaeologists can tell that the injuries didn't kill these people, but they died quite a while later. Don't ask me to go into details, but they can tell. Um, what that means, given that difficult lifestyle, is that when someone was seriously injured, other Neanderthals were looking after them. And there are many examples. You know, there's one where all the teeth are gone because of an illness. They can see the illness in the skeleton. And this Neanderthal lived until uh, his mid-40s, which for a Neanderthal was quite an advanced age. Clearly, he was being looked after, he was being fed, he was being cared for. Um, not only Neanderthals, who, after all, are extremely close to us, um, but Homo erectus, uh, who lived between 1.9 million years ago and 250,000 years ago. Uh, there was one particular skeleton, Homo erectus skeleton, which was dug up uh, in Northeast Africa 1.6 million years ago. As that's when he or she, it's actually a female. That's where she, when she lived. Um, and she had an illness called, where is it, where is it? Vitaminosis A, which affects uh, the skeleton, the teeth, the, the jaw, uh, many muscles. And interestingly, it takes weeks, if not months, to reflect itself on the skeleton. And this fossil, the skeleton is affected. So this woman lived, Homo erectus woman, lived for week, weeks, if not months, with this disease. Utterly debilitating disease, clearly looked after. And the people who dug this skeleton up um, their conclusion was there is no way she could have survived alone for long in the Af African savanna. Someone must have been feeding her, protecting her from carnivores. So, in short, if Neanderthals, Homo erectus, and Homo sapiens share a characteristic, then again, we, we can at least suspect that these, are, uh, th these characteristics are not social, but actually were shared by the common ancestor of Neanderthals, us, and Homo erectus. <coughs> Third reason to make us suspect that there's something more than social here is that it isn't just hominids who have these characteristics. Um, chimpanzees, obviously, but not just chimpanzees, all primates, to some degree, uh, have all, both experiments and uh, monitoring them in the wild indicate um, that they have compassion, they have empathy, there is even an argument that they have theory of minds. I'll come to that in a moment. Um, 
so for example, this is uh, chimpanzees uh, in Southeast Asia, in a particular chimpanzee reserve. Um, but, um, Thai, uh, the place is called Thai. Thai chimpanzees, totally independent of kin relationship, were regularly seen to tend wounded animals for extended periods of time. And it goes on and on. I, if, if a chimp is attacked by leopards and survives, the other chimps will stay behind, look after it, lick and clean its wounds. Um, they will, you know, they, if they're a moving troop of chimps, they will stop and wait until the injured chimp is better. And there are many, many examples of this. Um, as one particular primatologist, Franz de Waal, uh, who's the director of a chimp, uh, primate research center in Georgia in America, and he's written several books, countless examples of chimpanzees mainly, but other apes as well, uh, showing ser you know, signs of empathy, altruism, etc. So that means that it's not just hominids, but it's the last common ancestor of chimps and hominids. We're talking seven million years ago, who had these characteristics most likely, that, you know, when two species share a characteristic, it is assumed it comes from um, the last common ancestor. Okay. What I'd like, to, so there are three reasons I've gone through to make us at least want to look at whether, he, whether compassion, altruism, etc., cetera, um, are naturally selected. So, what I want to do is, before saying why I think they were selected, is to talk about a number of experiments. The first is this, and some of you may have seen this on YouTube, it's, it's hilarious. The experiment done by this Franz de Waal is as follows, there are two ca cages made of a transparent glass or something, uh, two chimps, and the chimps are taught a very, very simple task. They pick up a pebble and give it to the experimenter. In return, they get a piece of cucumber. Chimps will eat cucumber, but they don't particularly like it. <laughs> um, a bit like me. Um, so the first chimp hands over the pebble, gets a piece of cucumber, this happens with both of them several times, and then suddenly, one of them gets the cucumber, the next one gets a grape. They love grapes. The first one waits, and again gets a piece of cucumber. And he's very pissed off, you can tell. <laughs> but keeps an eye on what the next one, will, the other chimp will get. The other chimp gets a grape again. So the first one gets another piece of cucumber, reaches out and smashes the piece of cucumber on, onto the, the woman in the white coat doing the experiment. Clearly, they have a sense of fairness or justice or what's right and what's wrong. Um, it's not on YouTube, but Franz de Waal in his book says that in some cases, the, the, the chimp who was getting the grape also protested, although he was in an advantageous position. It's one. Okay, chimps are very close to us, as you all know. What about wolves? I read this on the BBC website about two weeks ago. Similar experiments with wild wo wolves. Um, not dogs. This has been known about dogs all along. This is wolves. Um, two wolves, they can see what the other's doing. One of them is taught to push a lever and both of them get a reward, piece of food. After a while, the one who's pushing the lever doesn't get a reward. The other one does. 
If this happens more than two, three times, he stops pushing the lever. Um, so even wild w wolves have a sense of um, something being unfair. Please note that the, the chimp who threw the cucumber back at the experimenter up to the point that the other one got a grape was perfectly happy eating cucumbers. So it's, it's not about whether he likes the food or not. It's about fairness. What have wolves and chimps have in common? They live in social groups. We shall come back to that. Um, OK, let's come to human beings. The ultimatum game is not a game, it's a scientific experiment. Two, two people, the, one of them is given $10. And he is told, you have to give part, part of this to the other person, any part, between $1 and $9. What do you think happens if a pers the, the, the guy who's given the money gives the other person $1? Now, bear in mind, it's the uh, scientist's money. So whether the guy gets $1 or $9 from the other guy, it's money for nothing. If, you are off, if, if they are offered $1, $1, almost invariably people turn it down. If they're op offered 2 almost invariably they turn it down. When they turn it down, neither of them gets any money at all. So, human beings turn down $2. I know it's not a lot of money, but it's out of the blue. It's, it's a net gain. They turn it down in order to ensure that the other guy doesn't get $9. It, they're punishing the guy who's being unjust and unfair. Um, th this, this experiment has been done again and again, and invariably you get this result. There is no homo economicus. It's, it's homo fairness. Um, and, and other experiments, um, two guys with electrodes on their brains. Um, I won't go into this, but you, you know um, scientists can see which bits, which neurons in the brain are lighting up. So there is a reward t system in the brain, and there is a pain system in the brain, various sets of neurons. Um, the game is this, the experiment is this. The two are taking part in a lottery, and what happens is that in the first um, pull of whatever it is they're pulling out of a hat, one of the guys gets $50. Second pull, the other guy gets $30. Now, what do you think would happen in the brain of the first person? Because the other one winning means you're not winning. So the pain circuit in the brain should light up. The reward center lights up, invariably. People are pleased having won $50 that in the second time round the other guy wins because some sort of fairness, some sort of balance has been established. Again, this experiment has been repeated countless times, and it's always the same. What this means is that achieving a degree of fairness in all these experiments is more important than making more money, because in all these cases, the money is out of the air. OK, let's, let me summarize what these experiments mean. I've skipped one, I think. No. OK. What it means is this. Um, even very young kids have a sense, because some of these experiments are done with very young kids, preschool kids, uh, have a sense of fairness and justice. They have a sense of cooperation. No, I have skipped a page. But where is it? Oh, yes. Because that's not the, the result of 
Okay. Three more experiments, sorry. <laughs> but the three I've gone through are to do with fairness and justice. These are different. Okay, the first one is an experiment called Cyberball. What happens is you'll put in front of a computer and you think there are two people playing a computer game with you. In fact, there aren't. The computer is programmed. And what happens is you and two other people are throwing a ball, playing volleyball in a simple way, throwing a ball around to each other. The program says, thanks, um, it, the program causes the computer after a while to exclude you. So the two other guys are throwing the ball to each other, but you don't know it's a program. You think the two guys have excluded you. The pain center, the, the pain circuit in your brain goes haywire. It's, it's utterly meaningless. So what if these two people have excluded you. But exclusion, social exclusion, is excruciatingly painful. Some of you will know, if your boyfriend or girlfriend or wife or husband leaves you, what lights up in the brain is the pain system, the same thing which causes you physical pain. Social exclusion causes physical pain, uses the same parts of the brain. Um, Secondly, uh, an experiment, tiny kids, one to two years of age, are put in a position where they can either steal or share with other, uh, other kids their own age. The percentage of kids who steal is much higher if there's no one watching. You put another kid in the corner of the room, and the rate of stealing goes right down at the age of two. At the age of two, kids are aware that they mustn't be seen to be doing something other than sharing. They don't want to be excluded. Um, I've completely fucked my notes up. Um, OK. So, I now come to the conclusions. <laughs> now it makes sense. Even kids who are not three years old yet um, have a sense of uh, not wanting to be excluded, a sense that fairness is a good thing, and if you're going to be not fair, it's best not to let anyone else see you, because they will exclude you if they do. Um, you, you made me panic by saying 10 minutes. I skipped one experiment, very briefly, two sentences. Um, there's a ladder, simple ladder because tiny kids, with two rewards, and two kids are asked to go up together to get their rewards. The condition is that they both have to reach the top for, any, uh, for, the, for them to get the reward, except Unexpectedly, one of them is given the reward when he's halfway up. The kid who gets the reward continues all the way up to make sure that the other kid gets the reward. Again, you know, um, incontrovertible, repeated many times. So there's cooperation, and kids under three understand that there are joint targets, joint aims, they understand what the other kid wants and will go out of the way to ensure that uh, the other kid does get it. I will now add three bits of information very quickly, and then I'll come to the conclusion. The first is this. Human beings are the only animal. We are the only animals who blush. Now, why the hell do we blush? What's, what's the evolutionary advantage of blushing? No one else does it. What it does, blushing is a way of saying, I'm sorry. It, it's a way of saying, I've done something wrong, 
but I know it's wrong. Shame. Why do we have a sense of shame? Why do we have a sense of guilt? Again, these are the reason these things were selected evolutionarily is that a sense of shame stops you from doing things which will cause the rest of your group to exclude you. It's what possibly causes the two-year-old kid to share rather than steal. That's one. Um, secondly, theory of mind. Theory of mind, it's a terrible name for what it actually is, is the following. It is a faculty of the brain which allows me to know what she's thinking. Allows me to understand that you have a separate brain from mine and it can have se uh, separate thoughts, separate views, and she's now thinking he's not gonna finish in 10 minutes. <laughs> I know this, therefore I begin to hurry up. And with, there are four levels of this. I know that if she gets pissed off with me, she'll tell our common friend. Our common friend will think, etc., etc. That's theory of mind. Um, we have it. It is strongly likely that other apes have it, although that's still um, debated. Five, six. Thirdly, mirror neurons. Mirror, okay, I know you're going to say five minutes. Um, mirror neurons were discovered only about 25 years ago, so it's very new, scientifically speaking. There are neurons in our brains which do the following. If someone uh, pricks your arm with a needle, particular neurons in your brain in the pain circuit will light up. If someone pricks my arm with a pin, your mirror neurons will light up, although you've not been touched. That's why they're called mirror neurons. And they're probably the, the, the biological, physical, physiological basis of empathy. Because the same neurons will light up, whether you're being hurt or I'm, you're watching me being hurt, it means you understand what I'm feeling. So, three little pieces of information, and now, because I empathize with you, let me try to finish. So, there are reasons for us to suspect that empathy, altruism, etc., are naturally selected. There are endless numbers of experiments which show that Many of these characteristics and feelings uh, begin to exhibit themselves in the human brain and even chimpanzee brains before we've been through the a formal education system or have been properly socialized. So, I now need to do a final thing. I have to show you if these things are hardwired and naturally selected, we need to be able to show what the advantage of these things is. For some characteristic to be selected, it needs to confer, us a confer on us a reproductive advantage. Yes? Okay. Now, the greatest invention of primates, comrades, is sociality. The moment human beings started living in small social groups, I think everything else almost automatically, don't quote me saying automatically, because nothing is automatic, but almost automatically, everything else follows. Because, think of what I've argued. Where does the fear of being excluded, which even two-year-olds have, come from? It comes from this. If you're living in a group of 30 tree-dwelling um, apes 
our predecessors, just beginning to sort of come down fr from the trees, just beginning to stand up and be bipedal, the savannah is a hugely dangerous place. The group has to behave as a group for each individual in the group to survive. If the group decides that you're a freeloader, that you don't share, that you are unfair, and that you will try and get things at the expense of the other members of the group, you will be excluded. That's why shame, embarrassment, blushing, not wanting to be seen to be um, unfair, is selected because it will stop you from doing it. If it doesn't stop you from doing it, you will do it and you will be excluded and you will be food for saber-toothed tigers. There is no way an individual can survive in those conditions without the group. That's where the fear of exclusion comes from. That's where the emphasis in the human mind on fairness, whether you behave fairly or not, we probably, I'm sure I'll be asked about that, regardless of whether you do it or not, you know that's the thing you're expected to do because it'll mean, it meant for millions and millions and millions of years of evolution, if you cooperated, if you worked together, if you didn't freeload, if you didn't stop sharing whatever you hunted with the other 29 members of the group, you will survive. If you do, you'll be excluded. There's huge amounts of evidence from 20th century hunter-gatherer societies where the same thing happens. People who do not share what they've hunted are excluded. And in the Amazon forest, they die. Again, the, the experiment where people will refuse one dollar in order to punish the person who's, get, who's going to get nine dollars is a similar thing. The need to punish freeloaders, the need to punish unfair uh, people who behave unfairly, again, is all part of living together socially. The moment the first, it's sort of very early Homo sapiens, uh, began to live together, all these other characteristics follow from it. Therefore, next time we come across anyone who says human beings are selfish, there can be no socialism, we should be very empathetic <laughs> and go and help them. Uh, well, we all know that what's usually said is that what, what's hardwired into, into our genes as humans and what makes socialism impossible is that we're innately selfish and, and warlike. Um, um, and, you know, you've seen the, the programs of chimps even who, who not only fight wars against other monkeys or other tribes of chimps, I think, um, but will actually plan plan the war and do it as, as a group. Um, as far as humans are concerned, um, we can see in the evidence of myth mythology, um, and you have to, to bear in mind that mythology um, can be dating from, you know, a, a myth can have evolved over many, many hundreds or maybe even thousands of years. It can record elements of something that's very, very ancient. Um, shows that as soon as humans were able to record their culture, that culture contained warfare. Um, archaeology, however, um, shows that, that, bef that before um, the development of class society, as Ronnie's meeting last year um, 
um, um, um, brilliantly um, on, on Chattel Huyuk, brilliantly illustrated that before the development of, of class society, this this didn't happen. Now, I want to stress that that um, uh, that the development of, of class society was very gradual and took took place over a long period of time. The early um, stage of which would have been just enclosure, enclosure of of all the almond trees, you know, so that we know where we can go go to get almonds. Enclosure of the wild cattle, so that you know this was the beginning of, of the development. This is the the beginning of it. Um, I read, um, okay, um, I read somewhere, and I think maybe it was Jared Diamond, about uh, tribesmen in like Borneo or New Guinea or something like that, who would like if if one uh, if one hunter met another hunter in the woods, they would immediately um, go into this ritual. Um, reciting of their ancestry and they would know you know I know my father back you know like 15 generations and um, the reason for this was because they wanted there was this strong impetus to establish some kind of kinship you know if like oh you must be my cousin because your great grandfather was the you know was the brother of my you know great grandfather so you know there was this strong uh, impetus to establish some kind of kinship because if there wasn't this kinship then they would fight so i think that even um even within okay even within uh, you know these warlike uh, class societies. Um, there's there's the 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 in group of 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 whoever your in group is, among whom this uh, altruism and unselfishness operates, and then there's the out group, um, with whom um, it's acceptable to fight. Yes, thanks very much, Ronnie. Once again, a really interesting uh, meeting. I always come to his esoteric meetings every uh, Marx and I can strongly recommend that uh, pattern of uh, Marx and watching. And while listening to him, it sparked a vague memory. I mean, people may have a better memory than, of this than me, of another psychological experiment. It's actually not a psychological experiment. It's game theory. I think game theory is done by mathematicians. A mathematician study, you know, what should happen, strategies in particular situations. And these brilliant mathematicians prove conclusively in a situation where you can either selfish or share or so on, that being selfish was the best strategy to actually achieve anything. Then they put it out and they tried it with groups of people. And they found again and again people refused to follow the correct strategy. In fact, there were only two groups of people who followed that strategy. One were economists... And there were psychopaths. <laughs> I think that says a lot. Of um, I agree entirely with uh, Ron's conclusions. I don't need convincing that that is in the nature of our humanity. And if I did need convincing of that, then I just needed to see what people did in West London after the catastrophic fire at Grenfell Towers. But this is going to be a curious um, contribution because I'm going to be devil's advocate as well. You talked about the fossil record. The fossil record may have shown that some people who were least able got cared for by their brothers and sisters, but it also shows, doesn't it, that people inflicted horrendous injuries on each other. Second uh, bit of devil's advocacy, after the um, atrocities of the uh, Nazis were fully came to light, a whole... Uh, social psychological industry developed in order to explain how could people behave like the prison camp guards etc we had psychological theories like tw adorno who said there's such a thing as an authoritarian personality but i'm going to talk in particular about some american experimentation led by somebody called milgram which you may know about but come back to me on it and what Milgram showed was that it was perfectly possible to dupe uh, uh, experimental subjects into inflicting gross pain 
in so-called learning experiments, not only gross pain on fellow human beings, but lethal pain. Uh, well, under, they were, under they the were American. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a sufficient answer, comrade. You come back to me on that one. <laughs> Um, perhaps on a more cynical note, I do think that a counter-argument can be applied that it's not necessarily a matter of fact that we are innately good people, that we conform to these social expectations to do these good things, but perhaps out of the selfish gain that we get from it. And I think an example of that could be, for instance, Tony Blair. Um, he, uh, for instance, when Princess Diana died... <laughs> exactly. When Princess Diana died, he made a big show of being very sad and these fake choking... Well, oh, I say fake choking, that's presumptuous, but choking during a speech and very dramatic and flaunting this idea of being a sympathetic character because he personally gains from that. And so, in, in that sense, it would be a, a selfish means of, um, of behaving as such. But um, on a more optimistic note, I do think that um, it can be taught to young children in the same way that we often see that if a, if a child is good at sports or if they're good at a subject, then parents reinforce this and we're like, yes, well done, you're really intelligent, I'm proud of you. But if someone does something good, it's expected and you don't get that positive reinforcement and so you don't encourage that behaviour and you want to feel good about these good actions, not for it to be something that's expected, if you see what I mean. And I think that's kind of essential. I think we need to focus more on praising the uh, genuinely altruistic traits rather than just talented, which we effectively just inherit anyway. But yeah, that's all I have to say. Yeah, um, I just wanted to come back on uh, the, the question of where a lot of this evidence comes from, because I think the aspects of it are very much worth emphasising. Much of the archaeological evidence, I think Ron has seen much of the same stuff I have. If, if you want to read some of this stuff that's in there in my book on disability, there's about three or four pages that actually go through this. And the importance of it is this. If you go back from, say, 4,000 years ago, right up till... The, late, the earliest one is 1.77 million years ago, and these are from many different parts of the globe. You will find evidence of people with all sorts of congenital impairments or impairments, that, injuries and so on, that were caused much earlier than the period to which that individual died. The, 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 ability, the, the fact that we can use DNA to actually analyse these skeletal remains. This is why we're able to make these uh, very clear judgments now, that we know that people, for example, who were paralysed from the waist down, people, for example, with severe spinal deformities, people, for example, that couldn't really walk for any, any distance, then clearly these people must have been looked after by other people. Now, the thing about all these societies is that when you look at where they were in the world and what kind of societies existed at that point in time in that part of the world, there's one thing they all had in common. They were all pre-class societies. That is to say there were societies that were not divided by class, but a society in which there was not a division between the idea of self-interest and interest on behalf of the community. That is to say that people's notion of what it was to be human was very likely shaped by that society in a kind of um, unfractured manner, if you want to put it that way. That is to say that the identity of uh, oneself and the interests of oneself were essentially the same as the interests of the community. Now, much of that is hypothetical. And the truth of the matter is, is that we lived in primitive communist societies or hunter-gatherer societies for 95% of human history. The problem is that that 95% of human history, there's very little records about that. And therefore, the kind of evidence that we have to draw on, we have to use the evidence that's very clear and, if you like, has an objective scientific value. And that's why I think that this evidence is very, very exciting, because it gets back to the question about, you know, it's not about going back to the past and saying, wasn't everything wonderful and so on, when life was really tough and hard and awful and you were likely to die very young and pressure, uh, um, um, being, being prey to the elements and all the rest of it. But the point is that actually it gets to the question of what Marx wrote about, which is about 
Really, our project is about the science of becoming humanity. Um, our, our project is the science of human liberation. And what that's about is about realizing the potentiality of human beings, which goes back to the essence of primitive communism, if you like, <coughs> equipped with all the technological, scientific, educational, and all the rest of the other advances that have happened over that intervening period and actually transforming our notion of what kind of capabilities humanity actually has beyond far anything far beyond anything that we've ever been able to experience before. Uh, okay, uh, I'm very dubious about what you've argued, to be honest. I, I have to say that um, I think that in a Marxist terms, uh, the essence of human being is their ability to labour and their ability to act on their world. And that to act on your world is better to done, done with other people. If you look at the origins of human societies as they developed, people needed to work collectively with other people if they were to transform their environment. Um, and, you know, I agree very much. If you look back at primitive communist societies, if you look back at all the evidence, it's true that people were altruistic, caring, sharing, that they were very collective, but I don't believe that that means that they're hardwired to do that. Um, I think that lots of it is about what was to advantageous to them to do that and it's about socialization and the way in which you socialize your children you see i don't believe it's the case that most children just say we should share quite often children say mine 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 until you tell them no it's not yours you've got to share it because that's what we teach our children to do so i really reject i think that I don't believe in genetic determinism. I think it's wrong. I think it's wrong to say that people are naturally warlike, and I think it's wrong to say that they're naturally caring and sharing. I think it's about how, and I think when you talked about, um, somebody talked about Grenfell, um, I think that's about basic solidarity, that when people stand together, they have got much more to gain when they stand together. So I don't believe that this is hardwired, really, because hardwired really implies that there's something genetic in us that means that we're hardwired. So I think that that's wrong. That doesn't mean that I don't think that the potential for human beings to transform their world doesn't lie in people collectively acting together. And I liked your meeting last year. I thought it was very good, but I don't agree with this. this. <laughs> This is my first ever time talking, so bear with me. Um, I think there's always been a problem between the argument of social influence or genetics. It has been a problem because there, there is a genetic correlation, but it's always been assumed that there's a causation and that genetics change the way that you behave, whereas there's an area of biology called epigenetics, which studies the way that... Um, Genes are methylated, which, so you have loads of genes, not all of them actually show as active genes. And um, the methylation makes them active, and this has been shown recently to be like the methylation process is created by social influence. So they've done tests on rats where they're fostered by different mothers, like uh, twin rats that are fostered by different mothers, one more caring than the other and then tested their genetics again. And the one more caring has different genes methylated to those from the less caring mother. Um, they've done similar tests in chimpanzees where they've tested uh, baby chimpanzees and they're actually aware of their social class from the second they're born uh, in the sense that their body will be, uh, like their metabolic rate will be different because they'll be less likely to have more food, so they'll binge, and then they'll hold on to the fat more. So, it's just interesting yeah. to uh, yeah. uh, There's a debate between whether our human nature is self-interested or even immoral, or whether we are, it's part of human authentic human nature to be moral. And Paul, um, 
uh, experiments with babies in Yale, aged three months, six months, ten months, well before anybody could explain to them in words, found that these babies are aware of justice, fairness, get quite upset when people are, they see puppets being nasty to each other and are pleased when they see them cooperating. And when you look at newborn babies, they don't arrive full of hate. They arrive actually full of um, readiness to engage, to trust, to love, to show affection and concern for others very, very early on. There's a video of a, a baby a few seconds old turning to his mother's voice because he remembers that from before. So to, be, to relate as ends in themselves and rewards in themselves, not just for survival and self-interest. So to praise children for being kind and nice, I think, is not sensible because they may well want the reward and the approval rather than, you know, that's, this is how we are. And if they are me, 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 well, all around them, they see adults grabbing their possessions and being me, me, me-ish, so is it surprising? Tomorrow night, we're going to look at the commodification of childhood and to think about, if you, we do want to have a revolution that works and lasts, how do we expect to treat and relate to our children and young people? And are we doing it in ways that will encourage that or discourage it? Uh, Richard, SWP. Um, Hackney. Um, Ronnie's talk reminded me very much of the uh, the work of the epidemiologists uh, Wilkinson and Pickett and their book, um, The Spirit Level. The Spirit Level being, if you like, an analogy for a, an unfair society. Um, and their findings are interesting because they show that all sorts of social pathologies um, from drug addiction, teenage pregnancy, uh, mental, Ill mental illness, um, obesity and so on. All those, all those factors obviously have a, a tremendous, you know, you go to a society which, where, the, where, you have, where you've got a, uh, uh, you know, gross inequality and those are countries obviously more like the USA and the Anglo-Saxon Anglo neoliberal economies um, and all those social pathologies are far more, extre are far, far more extreme. You go to a, a more sort of, uh, you know, inclusive sort of society. I've got somebody staying with me from Denmark at the mo moment. Uh, you know, welfare state, and uh, you know, the things that you, they obviously notice is that those so social pathologies that we see, you know, on the str on the streets of London today in terms of homelessness and so on, you know, are, are markedly not absent. But the thing about the, the the book is that it's not just it's not just the oppressed, it's not just the people at the bottom of the social pile um, that, suffer, that suffer in that way. It's also the, the, the elites at the top. And it's weird, isn't it? You know, you look at the TV footage of the, the elites um, at Ham, Hamburg, the, the water cannons, you know, uh, facing the, uh, the, the, de the demonstrators. They hang on to their privileges. They hang on to an unfair society. But they are just as much victims, if you like, from mental health uh, problems and so on, you know, or, or, or very much victims of of the society that they have they they have created. So I think that not only do we have to overthrow that type of this type of society to liberate ourselves, but we also need to, in the process, we'll be liberating our oppressors. <laughs> Uh, Trevor Doncaster, like, the first part of this be largely rhetorical because I'm not an expert. Having said that, I mean, it would seem to me that um, it's a cliche, but evolution, it's in our evolutionary interest to be empathetic and whatever, in terms of if we were naturally warlike, we, it would seem to me it would lead to our own um, uh, of our extinction. Um, I'm largely in agreement with Maxine in terms of, it seems to me, problematic to abstract the two issues as though they were separate issues and I think the guy who talked about ec epigenetics which is still a very sort of young science um, I think um, that's onto something even the brain stuff it's been discovered certainly in people with things like Alzheimer's and whatever that different parts of the brain will pick up different roles for periods so I think I do agree that, um, uh, that from the Marxist line the species being is us working on the world, and then that in turn impacts upon our physiology. And the reason I'm kind of erring, uh, or well, I do err to that side, is because, because of the issue of modernity. The comrade who talked about the Holocaust, uh, 
The comrade who talked about the Milgram experiments, these were not, as a great sociologist Zygmunt Bowman said, they were not sufficient, but modernity was necessary. Um, the people in the Milgram experiments were uh, put in a position where they were separated. You know, there are very, very specific uh, conditions which heightened a competitive element, and it's the same in the Holocaust. And that's the and and, and th this argument here doesn't fully explain how we now live in a society in which a small number of people own most of the resources and they have the capacity actually to destroy the world. And it's for that reason and for the lessons of the Holocaust that we can't be complacent about our social role in society under capitalism and the need to smash it and, 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 to, and, and to bring the resources and the wealth of the world to meet the needs of the many. Thank you. Clearly, my heart is with Maxine and the last comrades who spoke. But, it, it, Maxine, you just cannot say, sorry, some babies are very, you know, me, me, me. Because, I mean, I've gone through just a handful of experiments, but uh, the comrade who you sent back and then came back, who spoke about the Yale University experiments, countless experiments clearly show that babies who have no have been through no I mean even pre-language babies show all sorts of um, indications indubitable indications that they are born human beings are born with hardwired um, characteristics including language, by the way, including the ability to learn language, not just by listening to it. Um, and, you know, you, you, we can't just say none of, you know, it's all wrong. So, but I don't see that what I've argued goes in any way um, against what you were saying. Of course, the reason groups of 30 hunter-gatherers lived together and cooperated is precisely to it it's human labor changing the environment making tools <laughs> then making um settlements sorry think cabins to live in then settling down then agriculture but through all that process there is also a genetic process going on now several comrades have pointed out that the process, they haven't said so, but that's what, what they said means, that the process is much more complicated than I talked about. Of course, every sentence I uttered in my talk should have had a footnote, but I didn't have the time. Um, so, for example, um, of course, um, Susie mentioned warlike chimps. Yes, chimps fight war. Actually, I don't think chimps fight wars, but it doesn't matter. Let's not go into the detail. They do go hunting for other monkeys, and they do plan it, as Susie said. I needn't tell you that human beings fight wars and can be horrible, etc. Um, because, as I tried to say, it is not the, I'm not arguing that compassion, cooperation, altruism, empathy are hardwired, that's who we are, and we cannot do any harm to any other human being. No, genes don't work like that, which is why I particularly liked uh, the contribution of the comrade who said he was speaking for the first time. Absolutely. First of all, genes change. Social life then acts upon our genes. This, as the comrade said, is very new uh, discovery may not be the right, but we're only now beginning to get to know that. But secondly, it is not the case that psychopaths are born with a gene which makes them psychopathic. You can have twins, one of whom will end up being a psychopath, the other being a lovely person. They're separated uh, at an early age one is brought up by a family which is caring, sharing, 
shows them all the love and support. The other is brought up in a family. This is not an experiment. That it just happens. Um, another, the other one is brought up in a, f you know, uh, the parents are alcoholics and uh, one of the parents, whatever, horrible circumstances. One will be a psychopath. <coughs> one will be a lovely person, although they share their genes. So it is not the case <coughs> that genes make us who we are. It's genes in interaction with the environment. It's crucial to, to realize that. So obviously you make someone, <coughs> someone is born in a violent, crooked capitalist society, as we all are, and our genes are often probably sitting there thinking, what the hell am I going to do now with this person? because the environments will be telling us to do something else all the time. Some of the genes will change over the process. It's much more complicated. But it doesn't mean that uh, over millions of years, um, the human brain has been shaped to suffer pain when it is being unfair. That's what I mean by hard work. Now. There have been many attempts to explain this. Again, a comrade mentioned kinship. To explain this, to explain people being nice to each other in terms of kinship. I won't go into this. There's, I can see rustling of paper there. Um, but, you know, so the idea is, and I think some comrade did say it, that we will help people uh, who we are related to, but we're not, was it you, Susie, with people who are outside the group. But even that isn't quite true. I mean, we all know of cases of complete strangers ju jumping into rivers to save someone, succeeding in saving them, and drowning themselves. That is the exact definition of altruism. It happens. I think it is beyond kinship. Kin I'm not discarding kinship theories, uh, because I'm thinking early, very early hunter-gatherer groups were probably largely related within the group, but also not completely related, because generally women join other groups when they get married. So that's an argument which really goes beyond uh, our scope in, in this meeting. Selfish gain, comrade mentioned. Now, Everything I've said, all empathy, all altruism, all compassion, can be argued to be for selfish reasons. In my arguments, I said you don't want to be excluded because you'll die if the group excludes you. So f you can conclude from that that people are nice to each other and cooperate with each other for self-interest because they don't want to be chucked out and killed. But, okay, I don't care if that's self-interest, so be it. As long as people are nice to each other, who cares why? Um, bum, bum, bum. I think that's it. Thank you. Oh, oh can I, comrades, um, I, I have a brief reading list of something like 10 books which I've used in, in this talk. And I thought it would be a small meeting, so I made 15 copies. <laughs> um, but maybe you can be altruistic and share with each other. There's a photocopying machine on the ground floor. You're welcome to take one of these.